Arthur is still on mute. Okay. So apparently, uh, some of you might already know uh, Arthur. He's an electrical engineer, an uh, OSCW volunteer extraordinaire. He's uh, actually gonna do an informal uh, uh, workshop. Uh, it will be ah, around an hour or less. And it will be about storing large data and visualizing it uh, with a, a simple as possible approach, which is well, quite interesting. Uh, so, Artur, you got the mic and controls. Thank you, Elkos. And hello, everyone. So, um, okay, I guess we're complete. Um, so I'll give a short introduction about um, what this is all about, very briefly, and then we go into live coding. I was about to write um, what you need uh, for this coding, but uh, actually you don't need anything, just the web browser. It's going to be all online. Uh, let me see, there was something on the, on the Riot chat. You're not invited. Okay, that's not related to here. Good. Um, well, I really look forward to you um, following along with the coding. Uh, but let's first uh, give you a short introduction about what this is all about. So the onset is that uh, when you do mission operations, or in fact, any kind of other activity, uh, like uh, controlling drones or rovers or household uh, automation. You need to store data and then the next step would be you want to visualize, visualize the data. And that would be a typical dashboard that you would expect. Um, you can see here you have a map um, and uh, we have um, some time series data here, some metrics. Uh, you can put this as a plot or you can have this um, as a table. Um, yeah, and the question is, well, I take these two questions. First is, how can you store the data? And the other question is, how can you then plot this data? By the way, on this um, dashboard and on many other da uh, dashboards that I've looked, I don't see um, a kind of uh, schedule view, meaning that uh, in, in particular for mission operations, you, uh, you deal a lot with um, schedules, for example, with uh, ground station contact times to a satellite or with shifts as, or with procedures that run. So, uh, that these are things that have a start time and the end time. And uh, you could visualize those as a gun chart uh, but actually, there's no library, um, or maybe I haven't found it yet, that makes this easy to plot this uh, in the web browser. So I created my own. Um, well, but of course, before you start writing something, it's always a good idea to look at what's already available in the open source world. And some of these projects maybe are uh, very good, uh, but then they're so small that it's really hard to find them. Others are really big. They might be also very good uh, and they're well known for their purpose. Uh, but for me, like the first thing, one of the first things I looked into was this Elasticsearch. Um, there's also a front end called Kibana to this. Uh, but you know, the experience for me was um, I do a put so I input some data, a movie here, title, direct, and a year. And then in the next step, I want to read out to see what I have actually inserted. And what I get is this thing here. Um, so a lot of meta information uh, and stuff that, well, um, I was not interested in. I just wanted to basically get this thing back. 
could be that I'm just a fool and I don't know really how to operate Elasticsearch and I also found it a pain to set it up. Um, but yeah, this is where it started to to, to develop the idea that I need something um, that is more simple. And the reason for that is I'm a simple man. I like to have things simple. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's why I started this endeavor. And then we go directly to the to the live coding part. Um, so I mentioned that I like this things to be simple, the tools, and I also like them to be abstract of technology. So what you will see now, I'm actually using uh, in the background or in, uh, as a backend, I'm using MongoDB and Timescale DB, but uh, if you're using my libraries here, you're, that's totally uh, totally um, transparent to you, um, and you will see why. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, let's stop my webcam. All right. Um, so uh, the live coding will work like this: that I prepared a Jupyter notebook, actually four of them, and uh, you will load them and you will code uh, with me together through the notebooks. And this is really cool. There's this binder project. So you see here, I have this GitLab um, repository where I've prepared the notebooks. I tested them locally. Uh, everything is working. And then I go to this, well, first of all, I send you the link here in the chat. And uh, then you go to mybinder.org. Well, actually, you don't have to go there because I'm preparing this for you now. The important thing is that you select here GitLab and then you paste here um, the link to your repository. Well, you have to select the, the repository you're using. Of course, everyone is using GitLab because it's not owned by Microsoft. Um, and then you get here um, an URL to your uh, binder um, binder environment. So you copy this URL. I copy it here for you in the link. And then you open this. And what will happen, and this is, it will take uh, a bit, uh, but it's really cool. It's going to create now um, a, yeah, a virtual environment for you. Um, so it's preparing for for you, for me, for everyone who's using the link, a dedicated environment where you can run your notebooks without yeah, destroying. And uh, you, you can even change the notebooks. You can rewrite stuff. Um, but take note that this is, uh, when, when you close it, then all of the thing is, of course, lost uh, because it's, it's just running in a virtual environment. Um, and this makes it then really easy on, and nice to share with others during an online tutorial, for example. You can also see what's happening. Ah, so it seems like there's really a lot of people um, following the tutorial now, because it took a bit of time. Okay. Let's make this a bit bigger. You should hopefully uh, also be at this stage now that you see these four notebooks. There's also a requirements.txt file that shows you what other uh, libraries or what libraries I have used to install this. Of course, you can also download this um, repository and run these uh, notebooks locally, but then you have to make sure that you install those requirements via pip install minus r requirements.txt. Good. Can you please uh, shout out here shortly if you are there or or if there's a problem? Shout out if there's a problem. Oh, we're there. Okay. So then go into the first one, the document store. All right. So the idea was that um, 
if you want to store data that um, that you don't know the structure beforehand. I mean, most of us are familiar with SQL data, MySQL or um, MariaDB. You define your schema, so basically your table layout, what kind of information you want to store there, um, and then then you insert data. But many times, um, like if you think about JSON or uh, Python dictionaries, many times you might not know in advance how your uh, data structure looks like, or maybe your data is even um, uh, um, diverse. Then a NoSQL database is my, uh, likely better suited for that. Um, and as I told you in the background, I'm using MongoDB, but actually you can replace this with anything else that fulfills this pattern. And the pattern is as such. Um, I'm storing data uh, using a domain model um, category approach. So that means um, it's also a REST API uh, um, interface that, uh, that you're dealing with. So that's why it's uh, technology agnostic. So it's running MongoDB, but you're interfacing it via REST API. So in the end, it doesn't. You don't know actually what database is used in the background, and what you do is you do requests to um, this URL and slash a domain slash a model. So you can think of domain would be um, your project or uh, a mission or uh, you know some domain of interest um, that you're working on, and then in this my model you would uh, capture. Um, different aspects of this domain. Um, for example, uh, eclipses or temp uh, parameters or uh, temperature and so on. So for the rest of this tutorial, we assume now that we are going to um, um, store the contact times between ground stations and satellites, such as you you would likely need for SATNOX or, well, basically for scheduling passes to ground stations. Now, uh, if you want to run, uh, if you want to set up the document store um, locally, uh, then you would follow these steps here. So let's just zoom out. Uh, basically, uh, you clone uh, this repository and then you Docker compose it up. And that's what I'm going to do now. So you don't have to do this now, but of course, uh, you can do that. Uh, but for this tutorial, you don't need to do that because uh, I have set up one on a server. So I go into this um, repository. It's just a few files. Uh, if you actually look at the Docker Compose file, I mean, it's fairly simple. Um, really just, it's quite, quite easy to understand what's being done here. And um, there's one caveat or one different thing, uh, one that uh, one change that I had to do is I had to set the um, port to 80 because for whatever reason I cannot access my uh, this virtual server over a different port, only over port 80. So that's the main difference, but um, yeah. I don't know why, that, why it's like this. That's only for this virtual server that I rented. So Docker Compose up. And by the way, I did not pre-prepare it, so you can see it's being built live. Um, so it's pulling the repositories, this Docker image, um, extracting it, and then building the thing. Um, in the meanwhile, this shouldn't take long, uh, but in the meanwhile, you can look here at the imports at uh, step two. So if you run it locally, uh, you would use this step, and then this port also works fine. Uh, but we run it for this tutorial um, using this dem demo server. And I say it's, it's on port 80, so we don't need to specify here a port here. Now, important, please listen. That's important now. Because we're all working on the same server and putting data there. It makes very much sense that you use your own domain so that we don't clutter each other's data. So your name, replace it with your name or any anything that hopefully is unique among us. So that could be the name. Is there another Arthur? No. 
Good. So that should be unique enough. So you have to set this domain. Um, and then the rest uh, is fine. Uh, and now we execute the cell. And to execute a cell, you hold the Shift key and press Enter. And then you see here your URL. And this part here should be different for you. OK. Um, just to double check that our server is up, we take, uh, you open this one in your web browser. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. This is my cache. I don't know how to overcome this. I have to, it auto directs to HTTPS, but it's not HTTPS, it's HTTP. Wow, so I tested this literally before. OK, anyway, so here it is. Right, so this thing is up. Seems like somebody already tried it. Um, OK, so we are here at step one. Uh, everyone can read, uh, can access the server. Now we're going to enter our first data. Uh, so we do this by doing a post. And our data is a dictionary. Um, so it's a satellite and a ground station. And uh, so we schedule a path for the satellite over this ground station. And this is the start time. And this is the end time. Uh, note I'm using here um, this ISO format, also with the milliseconds. You don't need to do that. Um, uh, but it's generally, you see, if you can also do it like this, but then you have a space in, in, in the syntax and be better not. Uh, because later you do queries also via the browser and it's it's good if you can avoid the space here, so to be consistent. Um, so, insert the data, response 201, so that was successful. Um, and actually, let's have a look here at the server. Ah, I need to go to this incognito mode. HTTP, yeah. There, yeah, I can see already a few people. Too few people, please. More people. You can see uh, domains are being created. Yeah. Okay. So I have two people correctly following and another one not quite correctly following, but still following, and myself here. By the way, can you see that? So this admin config and local, this is just the MongoDB thing. Oh, maybe I, I would filter this out at some point. But you can see this domain's created here. Good. Um, next, I'm inserting uh, more data. See, I did insert a dictionary. If you want to insert more data in one go, then you use a list of dictionaries. And yeah, I post it to my endpoint. And yeah, I can do a, um, a request to see actually how my endpoint looks. Um, it's easier to do this in the browser because then you can um, See, it's more nicely formatted. So in my case, it was that was my domain, and that was the model name. Um, so you would see that those entries are there. Uh, they all get this unique ID. Um, that is actually something that MongoDB is doing, but we keep it because it helps to identify these individual documents. So you have all the data there. Um, and they're all more or less similar structure. Do you have satellite, ground station, start and end time? Now uh, I add uh, yet another pass, and this time I add a node. And see, and this is no SQL. You can, you don't, you can just open another field, and it will work. Uh, you can see this also here, and. By the way, I request here the data and I do a 
formatted as a data frame, so it's um, more pleasant to the eye. Maybe I should re filter out this ID field because it doesn't add much of value, but uh, you can see that uh, this last entry we, we did um, created a node, it had a node field, and that's not a number or not a value for all the others because we didn't define it. So for pandas, it looks like uh, that's not a number, but if you look on the web, you see that um, these are just the listings of the entries as you did, and then this one, this dictionary has this additional entry of, of the node. Okay, so far so good. Now, next is, uh, we know now how to create entries and to do a bulk insert of entries, and we know now that we don't have to structure them in the same way. In fact, the fields can be totally arbitrary. Uh, so that's the key of a document store. You basically store dictionaries there. Let's replace one entry. Um, so for this, we need to specify the document that we want to operate on. Um, replace, so to replace an existing document, let's replace this first entry. So we copy the ID, copy it over here. And we replace this whole entry here um, with just hello world. Do this, yeah, it's, let's see the result and write, see? The first entry was completely changed and all these values now are not there and only hello world is there. You can see this also here, just hello world. Fantastic. Next is if you want to modify an existing, not replace an, um, an, a document, but modify it. So let's go up a bit. We have this one here, note, this path may be canceled. So we got a confirmation, it's not going to be cancelled, it's going to take place. Copy the ID, paste it here, and we're going to change this node so that it's confirmed. Okay. Um, uh, let's have a look the, at the effect, I just go up again and list it here now. And you can see this path is confirmed, so the node was updated. This particular field, as we wanted. Uh, by the way, I'm not uh, like uh, I don't read the chat. Uh, I've, I'm focusing on the on the notebook. So if you have a question, open your mic and ask me live, please. Juan asks uh, Juan Rojas, uh, yeah. why change the column name? The column name, which one? Where? The first row, actually. I'm sorry. The first row now is hello. Ah, because um, this was the inset of data. Uh, so, no, sorry, I replaced the whole document. That means basically you have this ID endpoint, um, this stays as is, but everything else will be replaced. And I just put this document here. That means it has no value for N, ground station, satellite, start, and node. So this is all gone. And instead it has a field called hello and the entries world. So, okay, I get it, I get it. Now you, uh, you created a new, new one. Yeah, you're overwriting what was there. Okay. Um, so this was, yeah, inserting data, uh, replacing data, modifying data. Let's go to the read section. We already did a lot of reading in between to see our, the effects. Um, but let's start formally uh, to get uh, a list of all the domains that you have on your server. And you just do a GET request on on the host URL. Uh, you can see all, you can see the people who are actually following. Um, then let's get a list of of the models in your domain. You see, I'm just doing the com uh, just put host plus uh, the domain, and we have only created this passes model yet. And if I want to get a specific document, I can do as well, but then I need to get an ID. Let's copy this one here. And that would be a modify patch. Uh, let, me, let me just confirm. I take 
this one here. This one I copied, right? Okay. So anyway, so I can get um, the values of, of a single document. Mm, most of the time you might not if you want to see and then if you want to see all the all the data stored uh, you just uh, do a get request on the endpoint um i must say it's quite uncommon actually that you work on documents uh, via id um there might be use cases but um and also you don't usually get the whole want to work with the whole data set because it should be come quite large and i'm talking about millions uh, or, uh, of rows or uh, sorry documents so what you then need is filtering and i already mentioned that no sql leaves you the um, it doesn't predefine a schema that you have to use and that's great on the one hand because you can arbitrarily then define new uh, formats for the documents or uh, fields but it's when you retrieve the data that you have to put extra attention because you have to know what you're looking for and you know to know what you can filter for so the endpoint is is this one here uh, your domain and the passes that we created so far right and what I'm going to do now is to filter um, for specific fields you see you have the ground station field and I want to filter for those ground stations that you use or the ground stations called antenna X and antenna Y. So I can, uh, um, this is this um, yeah, special operator to denote that the following thing is a query. And then you write the uh, field name and then equals to, you can specify one value or several values via a comma. And you can see in the reply, we get antenna X and antenna Y results, and there's actually only two of them, right? The other ones are antenna Z. Um, you can also filter for more than one field, and it's an uh, end concatenation. So meaning now I'm looking for antenna X, and uh, those that are at, allocated to satellite X and satellite Z. And there's actually only one. So um, antenna X is tracking satellite X, but it's not tracking satellite Z in this case. Well, you can play around with this by inserting much more data, and then you can see how this filtering works uh, and also how fast it is. So I say you can filter for uh, specific values of these fields, but you can also, and that's really the powerful part, you can apply some filtering logic uh, operators, uh, I list them here. So you can have lower than, lower or equal, greater than, not in, so you can exclude values, field values, and so on. Also regular expression. So for example, if you want to, let's say, have all the passes that start of, yeah, from March onwards, oh, let's say, oh, that's 2020, but you can see this, this is all from 2020, and I want to have the values that start, the passes starting from March, and you can see them here, and those are the April passes. And again, I, you always see here the URL that is being formed, because um, in fact, if you go over and use a REST client, or even just your browser, uh, that's then, you will get um, the results here as well, right? So your browser is it's basically a REST client in that sense. Um, and you can see that that's, why, that's also the reason why I prefer to use uh, this ISO format, uh, because then you don't have this space here in between, and the space sometimes this gets converted to this uh, weird symbol. So if I leave space, I think it would work. Yeah, but I prefer not to have a space in, in the URL. Okay. We were here. Then, hey, this was filtering. That was a, is a, is a big thing, filtering. You will do filtering a lot, 
because you need to find the documents of interest and so you need to filter for them and then you get data back and sometimes you get even even when you apply filtering you still might get a lot of data back documents back so you want to one way to handle this is to do pagination meaning that you say okay give me back uh, results in chunks of two so two documents uh, per request uh, or let's say take all the data all the result all the results and uh, yeah put them into chunks of two and then give me the chunk or the page number two and then you get here these two replies and this would be basically the second page you can compare this uh, if you, you know one two and then you will start here one two um, another nice feature is of course to just apply limiting so you can say just I don't even apply any filter here so I request everything uh, but I limit it just to to one answer uh, to one return and the cool thing is that this is being done on the server side of course so it's not that all the data is being sent to the client and then it will just display one no no it will um, only from the server uh, send uh, send one or ten or whatever limit you specify here and this is quite handy if you want to for example get your latest entry then you go from you would you would uh, that comes later you would sort it by time and then limit it by one and then you get uh, your latest or your earliest entry etc uh, quickly projection is um, as you see you always get the, the full result here uh, all uh, everything that you put in the documents you get returned but sometimes you maybe just want to see let's say the satellite and the ground stations involved in your in your data and then uh, you you filter for the fields um, you might have also noticed hopefully that all these special operators they start with the underscore so whenever you don't use underscore it's interpreted as a field and then it applies this filtering onto the fields uh, but if you use the underscore then for the sorting for the limit and so on then it knows this is a special operation and it will apply that so in this case i get only the ground station and satellite fields back and the id is always there so uh, uh that's just an artifact we keep it for now sorting as well you can specify the sort again it's a special operation so underscore um, and uh, you say I want to sort by satellite but in reverse direction and then uh, in the second so that would be the first sorting priority and then the next would be to sort by ground station again I show this one in the browser make it more clear so we see it's sorted by antenna in reverse so that okay ah sorry we sort first by satellite in reverse z y x x x and then the second is by ground station so z y and here's x x x so x y z okay so satellite is ordered in reverse but then within the same satellite uh, the ground station is ordered alphabetically so yeah all the things you need to to filter your data and to to sort it good next thing would be yeah to sort ah so this was sorting by some uh, fields but um, most of the time you probably want to sort by time and for example to sort by start time um, you would do like this and then you get all your passes ordered by start time so you know this one is the next pass taking place and then see this, the start time is here um, what did I do wrong here no that time yeah two February February April April so good so we have a lot of data but at some point you want to delete the data or clean up so you can specify a specific uh, id clean that one gone uh, if you want to delete more than one uh, you can apply a filter 
So example, I delete all the ground stations that uh, that are allocated to antenna X and Y. Boom, gone. Two are deleted. Have a look. So we have only that here. And then this entry here left over. Uh, and then we can also delete the whole domain by just hitting a, a delete uh, request on passes model. So it's a, a HTTP delete request on the passes model. Uh, I could also, and I can also delete the entire domain. Um, yeah, by doing a delete on the domain. Actually, since the passes model was already the last one, I will get an error here because, um, and that's a nice thing. If you delete the last, yeah, if you delete the last uh, model in your domain, then your domain also has disappeared because there's no data in it. Here's some information on when you have your data. Uh, if you want to dump it, there's also utility functions to dump the data into JSON format, and that makes it easy then to to share it uh, with others um, rather than um, having to do a copying uh, it directly from the MongoDB database. Because I repeat, we want to be agnostic of the of the actual backend storage. Wow, so this is part one of the tutorial. There's three more to come. How do you feel so far? Can I get some feedback? Awesome. Hey. Very interesting. OK, that keeps me going. Um, let's leave. Let's close this. So yeah, so this is via the um, via um, I, I use this request library uh, because it's it's much more human friendly uh, as compared to this URL lib from Python. But still, what you were doing is to create basically text strings and then passing this to the requests uh, module uh, to execute it. So basically, you were doing the same as if you write this. Uh, expression here uh, in the browser. So that's not very Pythonic, I think. That's why I wrote this RESTDB client, which then provides a Python interface to this REST client, um, uh, which seems then a bit of an overhead. But the whole idea is that you make this thing, uh, this uh, database available to, well, basically any language you're using because you have this REST API interface. And then it's convenient to have um, yeah, a local uh, client in your language to make dealing with this REST API easier and more idiomatic, I think, is the word for that. So let's get started. You would install this if you do this locally. Again, here you need to. Um, Make a change here. Um, we're going to use this so demo server, right? And again, put your name. And now everyone can follow because this is really short and easy. So please put your name here. And let's go. So I'm not using the data from before. I'm, I'm using another data. Um, and that's how your REST client should look like. You're connected to this server and uh, we're now uh, defining a bit the solar system here so you can see that um, I have this client that is connected to this URL uh, to this host and my domain is here my name and I make an object uh, that way and um, so this is my domain object. And within this domain, I, um, I create a model called solar system. OK. Boom. And now um, I have a data set. It's uh, is a list of uh, dictionaries. I write here planets, their moons. And sometimes I leave out this information. And you see, it, it's totally, um, uh, yeah, they do not look the same, right? I mean, the, the structure here. The content, of course, also not. 
And then I use this insert method from the model to insert this data set. And you can see here, that's that's all Python. Huh? It's a dictionary, list of dictionary. Uh, I use a, a method. I inserted these three um, data sets. In order to read the data, I do a, a find request, or uh, I use the find method. Um, and here, I would then could provide a filter. But if I don't provide a filter, then it will just return me everything. And in order to make this look a bit more pretty here on this on this uh, screen, I use this uh, adjacent dumps for this. But basically, yeah, just your data is in the data sets, and here I'm printing it nicely. So it's not so nice, but at least it's better, easier to read than without this one. Uh, so the data is there, and everything has their own ID. OK. And as a next step, I'm applying some filtering. So in this case, I want to get all the um, all the planets that have moons that have more greater equal one. So that have at least one moon, or um, as specified here. Right. So I didn't put anything for Mars. So even though the, it has one, but in, in this data set, it doesn't. And I'm here with um, uh, Earth and Jupiter. And in order to delete, uh, so that's how filtering works. Um, I don't go through all the other things because it's uh, similar to this, uh, uh, to what I showed you before. But you work here with uh, dictionaries. So that's the a uh, nice difference that you can uh, be more uh, Pythonic here in defining your filter and or sorting and fields. OK. And for deleting, I can also apply a filter. So here, this one will delete the Jupyter entry. OK, so it's gone. And uh, you can, uh, meantime, you can also go to the um, to your browser and just verify that. See, we have two entries left. And then the deletion and uh, of, of models and domains and uh, specific entries, this works then the same way as before. So you have this uh, model and domain objects that you in uh, that you create early on like here but even that sometimes you don't want to do it it's a bit maybe too cumbersome to write so there's also some helper functions like uh, if you just want to load data sets uh, and you know the name of the domain and the, and the model then you can use this helper function uh, you provide uh, this client object and then here this is text right that's the name of your domain and this is the model name and you can supply filters and so on and um, then you get the results as well and that makes it more yeah easier than to automate this thing all right okay that was uh, the fast one on this client and close this one now we go to the so this was all about documents uh, storing kind of uh, dictionary like data now let's talk about time series because this is the other kind of data you see a lot in let's say in the internet of things or your metrics of your computer um it's the the characteristic of this data is that you have um a timestamp and a value uh, and all the other things, um, uh, you, you cannot, uh, um, uh, all the other metrics uh, you would have here, uh, you, you have to get out of the context or you have to log it in, in a different way. Um, I think, <laughs> right now I'm not sure if we can even store uh, more fields. Um, 
but here it's the same approach. You have um, a domain and parameter category. In this case, I call it not model, but parameter. Um, that's more or less the, the same way. So you uh, provide your URL and access it. For example, your device, your Raspberry Pi that you use at, at home to measure the room temperature, that would be your device. And then the measurement it ta is taking here, the temperature or the current or the voltage or whatever. And then you would put your values here with a timestamp and with a value. And for this tutorial, we assume storage of uh, temperatures, temperature measurements of a satellite. Again, uh, we're going to set up now the uh, um, the uh, this uh, time series um, store. Oh, I lost my connection here. This one here. I have to close it down because, uh, as I say, um, it's only uh, with the server. I have to run this on port 80, and there can only be one on one on this port 80. So uh, at home, you can have them running, of course, in parallel, and you can define which ports they run on. And again, um, it's building now. So once this thing is built, so you build it once and then, then you run it. Uh, but this is like uh, out of the box, completely fresh, it's just waking up. And there's one feature that is also explained in the README. Uh, it's that when you've started for the first time, um, you have to stop it again and, and start again because it's setting up something, and for this you need to to uh, uh, to yeah to restart it. I'm sure there's a way to handle this. I don't know how to do it, so if you find out how to make this nicer, but it's it's really a minor thing. Once this building is done, uh, you stop it and and restart it. Meanwhile, um, same thing here. We're not running it locally this time, so we're using the server that's already prepared for you. Uh, put your name again here. Maybe small letters. And we're storing temperature Y data. Don't execute it yet. But actually, you can execute this part. And then you should see a URL like this. Um, and it's not ready yet. You see, it failed. So I just stop it here and I start again. And this is also how fast it would take usually to start up. You see, it's a, it's a, it's a second it took to start up. So once this thing is built, it starts up super, super fast. Let's have a look. It's not, there's no data yet there, but you can see, well, there's no data in it yet, but the server is up. Can test this now that you can reach the server. Let's put some data in. And I just warn you that this request will not work. I'll tell you also why. So execute uh, step three. We want to insert data with a timestamp and a value. And we get a 404 response. And this is because, um, well, in the background, this one is using a SQL database, it's a Postgres. Um, and actually, it's this timescale DB, which works on top of Postgres to make this really uh, well, to able to store huge amounts of data. And in this case, you need to define uh, beforehand what kind of data you're storing. And we do this now. So we, we write to this meta um, URL or endpoint. We define. First of all, the name of our domain, the name of the parameter, and the type. And here you can, uh, you have to look it up what types you have available, but those basic types like float, int, string, and so on. And this you do only once per parameter that you want to store. 
Right, so we do this now. So it's created. And actually, let me test if you can see this here. If I created this endpoint. Yeah, right. So you can see here all the um, domains, model, parameters, and, and types. So, so each of these three people here, they have created one. You have to create separately per domain because domains are completely um, yeah, separate from each other. That makes it possible that many users use the same server. And now we repeat what we did before. We want to insert data. And well, seems like it worked this time. 201 means uh, something was created. Before we have a look, let's add some more data. In this case, it's a list of dictionaries. Okay, and now let's have a quick look if we actually, um, uh, well, let, let's have a look at our server from here. So we look at all the um, uh, domains that are on the server, those three. Uh, let's get a list of all the parameters we defined in our domain. Temperature Y, only one. And let's get all the data from this from this endpoint. Whoops. Did I forget there's a typo? Uh, no. Okay. Who spots the typo? Interesting. That's the endpoint. Temperature Y posting to it. And I don't get anything. Ah, oh, that's not good. Let's print it. So I also got uh, the um, non-empty result, the same as Juan, but I'm not sure why, Arthur, you don't get a result. So you have the data. Yes, and Juan also. Okay. Um, maybe the name. <laughs> Can you look? Uh... I will try with your name also, Mark. Uh, uh... If I search your name, I don't have any data. <laughs> okay, so maybe I have a very special name and this is protected by timescale DB or whatever. Okay, that's something to look into. Um, but if I look at your data, uh, I, I see it here. Very good. Um, and let's let's then uh, uh, let's uh, rename our endpoint. I make this. Good. I hope you're okay if I use your data now. So I say that the domains are separate, but nothing keeps you from uh, <laughs> using the other people's data. Um, so let's do some filtering here. Uh, well, it's not filtering. It's uh, you specify a specific time you want to get the value of this, and you see I have um, I have exactly I get this entry here back. 
Uh, you can also supply uh, comma separated several dates and then you get the entries for those dates. Mm. Maybe I did a typo here also. Um, yeah, there's no, take this one here, 15. Well, anyway, you get the meaning. So I can provide a list of timestamps and then I get the values, but again, nobody's going to do that. Most of the time you use just some filtering, like everything that's from January 2nd onwards. Okay, so uh, <laughs> there's none, of course. Yeah. Let's grab uh, 1st of January, let's say 1015. And we have a greater or equal, so that should be included as well. See, 1015, 1020 entry. Uh, again, limiting to one. Just get one result out of all this, and then I can sort by time minus time even, so get the latest one. Oh, sorry. The, um, uh, now it's sorted backwards in time, but and then I can limit it, and then I get my latest entry. That would be that one here. Okay, so more or less uh, the same approach like with the document store, but this time for time series data. Now, the next step would be to delete data, and that's not yet implemented. You might wonder, oh my God, why not? It should be fairly easy, but it's not because uh, you, you remember we have to we define this metadata here uh, to tell the database what data we have, and we still need to think about are we going to delete this as well? And so yeah, it's still ongoing uh, thing, uh, discussion of how to handle this case. So you're very welcome to join us in this. I make a decision here. Now comes the last step. I think we can finish this in five minutes. Um, it's also good that we don't de delete the data because we need it for now. We want to plot this data now. And this was actually, should be, well, half of this, right? One is to store the data and retrieve the data. And uh, the other big thing should be to visualize it. Uh, the tutorial now is a bit short here. Uh, but you can experiment at home with it. Um, uh, I think it's quite powerful, but still easy to use. So, again, you don't need to install. Um, I'm, we're using the server here. And here you put your name or the domain that you want to plot. And now comes the nice feature. So this Python database library, there's a lot of plotting stuff available, of course. Matplotlib, um, then there's Borky, then uh, there's so many plotting, Plotly, there's so many plotting libraries available. Uh, but I was really inspired by this Vega Lite visualization grammar that's uh, for, uh, I think, a JavaScript library. Um, and they kind of abstract the, uh, the definition of a plot from actually the technology to used to plot it. If you do a, I mean, if you do a matplot lib figure, you know how cumbersome it can get to specify this and this and this and that. And then if you want to plot it, let's say with the pandas data frame library, then they use a different syntax again. So this Vega light abstracts it. Um, um, well, the, the, it suggests an, a way to abstract this data but this is not available in, in the Python world yet, as far as I know. As, as far as I know. So um, I try to implant, do it like this. So I create a specification, and this is not exactly Vega Lite syntax, but as close as one can get. And it's also not complete. There's still stuff to be done, but basically you specify the layout of your plot. Uh, you specify where you get the data from um and how you want it to be drawn and then you tell the fields that you get f in this data so we have um well on your x-axis you ha you read the field uh this time field and you specify it's a, it's a temporary context so it means it is a time value and this one is a quantitative 
uh, value on the y-axis and you take it from this field value. You see, this library is not tied to this time series store. You can actually uh, apply it to any URL. Um, actually, you can also pass in data frames. Uh, but anything that ad adheres to this format where you, where you have time, um, where you have columns, data and columns, um, and this is basically for data frames or any kind of uh, a lot of URLs that uh, uh, have REST APIs, like to plot uh, timetables of buses and taxis and so on. Um, okay, so this is just a dictionary. And now we pass this dictionary um, to this data with figure creator. With, and then it, well, if you don't pass any parameter here uh, and the time we want to display, then it displays uh, the entire uh, data available. You can also fil do some filtering here for some specific time. And we want to use matplotlib as a rendering engine. So if you execute this, um, so it seems like you created some more data. Oh yeah, great. So you added some more data in the meantime. Um, and this is the plot of it. And you can see that um, since you choose very uh, crazy volumes here, uh, values here, so you have 999 and zero, and they're all here. Uh, so the plot uh, looks a bit funny, but basically um, uh, it's plotting your data here, right? So it's all correct if you compare it with what is here in the database. Uh, but that's a matplotlib figure, so it's static. Um, you can configure it, you can give some titles here. Uh, but if you want to get a more interactive visualization, then you can use Boki, which is very nice because you can zoom in. And then you would actually see that you have here data. I can actually can zoom also on this axis. Well, let's reset the zoom. Let's make this. Okay. Um, yeah, you should really learn more about Boki. Go here, click this logo or search it up. It's really a cool library for this interactive plots. Um, and you can see this is basically the data you specified here being plotted. And this is super nice to really inspecting your your time series data or actually any kind of other data that you plot with this data with library. And this works also very nice. Um, as long as you're in the order of, let's say, 100,000 points. Um, by the way, talking about points, they're called circle in... See, we are... Now they're drawn as small circles. Uh, we can zoom in. Again, this is Boki. Um, so I'm just utilizing this really cool Boki um, library. Um, but yeah, what I did is I, I provide a very easy interface to create those plots. And I say you can uh, plot up to 100,000 points of data and it still goes very smooth. But if you start plotting millions or yeah, more points, then this thing gets really laggy. And at some point, your memory will not be able to handle it. And then your browser page doesn't load. And there's another project it's called Data Shader, which is able to pre-render your data and then put this as an image. And this is really powerful stuff. And we're working on implementing this as well. So then you would have here Data Shader. Um, it's not there yet, yeah. Exactly. So this is work in progress, uh, and this, this is going to be even more exciting than to plot really large amounts of data. OK, I have actually uh, some more pictures on this. But uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I stop for now. That's one hour of a tutorial. Um, and I'm really happy to answer a couple of questions if you have before we make a break. Questions, people? 
Okay. Good. Um, anyways, you can redo this tutorial anytime. You have the links. Um, you can download it, and you can contact me anytime with questions. Fabian, yeah, I think you have a question, right? I just wanted to give it feedback because uh, I was just a, a bit overwhelmed to to now find find a good question. Sorry. Okay. Good. I think then uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, let's have a ten minute break before we already come. Wait, my webcam. Before we already go to the uh, closing session. Ah, so fast. <laughs> Whoa. Did you, you already? To, uh, oh, I have a question yeah. for, for Arthur. Maybe. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Back to the, the, the topic from your um, tutorial. Uh, did you, do you already have a database where you put some um, actual um, yeah, satellite data in into? Actually, I, I use this uh, um, at work and um, uh, yeah, as a support to uh, do this, get an overview about the passes that we have. Um, but maybe I think maybe Satnox or uh, the, some tracking that would come to mind uh, to be a perfect use case for this. Um, I just think that would be useful for uh, Satnox. Kerel, especially that you're from better familiar than me with the project. Uh, yes, so technically wise. So technically wise, uh, what you presented was, was really the the nice interface with uh, sorting and uh, filtering, which is uh, well a good improvement of our other services. Um, from the implementation wise, we already have a, um, um, a database, so everything we would we can only uh, use uh, things which we can put in front of uh, such a database um, but i think the, the tools are there and we could use the same um, interface to access or, or, or um, to to modify it to to write a, a, a to use the same database we are using this could be modified yeah from what i've seen uh, as far as uh some of it uh, could be also be an inspiration uh, not only for uh Satmuk, but uh, for other projects or for something uh, closer to the individual uh, machines we have uh, at home at C. You never know. We are much more hiking right now. Well, let's say I'm using this. Uh, I'm using this myself a, a lot. So, uh, and I didn't find any other uh, thing that's easy to use and is a, uses a REST API. So, even if I'm the only user for it, I, I'm okay. But I think there's a huge use case. Uh, just people maybe might not aware of this. So now they are. So feel free to use it. Especially missions who want to work on their own data, uh, doing manual um, analysis, um, then you can also think about exporting a whole um, uh, frame dumps from Satnox or other sources into such a database, and then have a nice interface. And I think this is really a good tool for for missions. Good. Thanks very much. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Juan, so yeah. I was thinking about the uh, integration with uh, some kind of dashboard, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, yeah, I have. We have, of course. Um, that was super easy for you, but <laughs> for me, I have no idea. So. Um, uh, well, the thing is, we also, I also, <laughs> we also write a dashboard on ourselves. Um, but, um, you mean with something off the shelf, some dead not like Kibana or so? I, I didn't try it yet, no. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was thinking something like that. But... Mm. 
Good, but we can talk uh, offline uh, more about this. I have to leave now um, to prepare for the uh, for the ending, which will take place in ten minutes. So I look forward to see all of you in room number one. Bye, Arthur. Good. Ciao, ciao. Take a break. Bye. You deserve it. <laughs>